everybody. All right, so welcome to our sixth Facebook, Facebook Live event uh, of this year. I'm pretty excited to host these um, so I can talk to you guys. And this month we are talking about microchipping and pet anxiety. So um, throughout this whole event, we do encourage you to submit questions and make comments and everything, and uh, we'll try to answer them. There's two things I want to be sure to mention before I forget. So the uh, first one is we want to talk about microchipping today. We are currently running a special on microchipping. If you choose to microchip your pets, uh, you'll get 300 pet desk points. Okay, so what do those do? Um, what you can do is you can use those for money off on medications, examinations, and things like that when you come back into the clinic. So it's basically like a money back for something that's a good idea to do anyway. The other thing we're going to um, run a special on is our flea tick and our heartworm um, disease meds. And we talked about that a lot with last, um, last month's little Facebook Live. If you purchase six months, you get 300 points. So again, that's $5 towards your next visit or any purchase of anything else. And then if you purchase 12 months, you get 750 points and that's uh, $12.50 towards a visit or purchase of, of anything else you'd like. Um, so both of these are gonna end at the end of this month on the 30th. So they keep running for another six days. So I wanted to be sure to mention them so that Anybody wants to get um, in on those can definitely do that. Uh, in the meantime, um, we're gonna go ahead and get going here. Um, so we're gonna talk about microchipping, we're gonna talk about pet anxiety. I think where I'm gonna start is I'm gonna start with talking about microchipping, okay? So uh, what is a microchip and why do we wanna do it? So a microchip is a, a very small, um, it fits inside of a needle, okay? And then it's just gonna go underneath the skin and it's just a little chip and it doesn't constantly emit anything. It's not a GPS tracker or anything like that. But if you take a scanner and you run it over top of it, it's going to bounce back and talk to that scanner and it's gonna give it a unique number. And so that's that animal's unique identification number. What that number is, is then saved in a database. And you have to go in and put in your information so that that number gets associated with your information in that database. So let's say we have a cat or a dog that somebody just found on the road and they bring it in because they're, they're a good person, they're a good Samaritan, and they want to help this dog they just found. First thing we're going to do is we're going to scan it. And if I have a microchip and I get that number, I go and I plug it into the computer and that number comes up with a microchip company who I can then call, they look up that account, and then you get a call that says, hey, somebody found your dog, somebody found your cat, um, do you wanna set up a pickup? So you don't have any confusion or anything. Now, if you get a microchip, so let's say you got a microchip, um, your pet came microchip from a breeder. A lot of breeders are putting microchips in these days. Those aren't automatically registered to you, okay? So if you have a microchip in your pet, the puppy you just got from a breeder, um, and you don't register it, I'm gonna get this microchip number, I'm gonna get all excited. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go plug it into the computer and it's gonna come up with nothing. And so that doesn't help us because that doesn't tell me that, oh, this was an, an owned puppy that was purchased from a breeder. What that tells me is that a breeder probably put a microchip in this dog and it either could have never got adopted and it just ran off, or maybe at some point it got picked up by the dog pound because they put in microchips as well and it just escaped, we don't know. It's not registered to anyone. It has an identification number, but it means nothing. Okay, so it's essentially the dog is unowned. It tells me that at some point, somebody liked this dog, but that doesn't mean that they're still the owner or that the dog is owned at this point. So what do I do with this dog? Whoever brings in the pet, whoever found it, as far as who is responsible for this dog, I guess the legal owner at that point is the person who brought the pet in. Um, unless we happen to find the original owner and they can have proof that that dog with that chip number is their dog, um, it, but it's gonna take a lot longer to prove that it's your pet. Otherwise we have to go off of, well, it has a microchip, that's awesome, but that doesn't help us at all. And so that person who found that dog can just contact that microchip company and say, hey, this is my dog. And then 
they'll have proof that it's their dog for eternity. So microchips are awesome. They do return a lot of pets every year, but if you don't take that extra step and register that chip, it, it's not gonna help you at all in making sure your animal comes back to you. And it does, what we do here at the clinic to try to help keep that from happening is if we do place a microchip, we immediately go and put your information in with the company. So you don't have to go through that extra step of registering it, we do that for you. Um, included in our, our microchip cost here for the implantation, we include that registration of that pet. I just mentioned it because if you get it from a breeder, you do have to go take that extra step and make sure that that microchip in your dog is actually gonna help your dog. As I mentioned, it's not a GPS tracker, um, so it's not constantly emitting a signal or anything. So if your pet gets lost, it's not gonna help you, you know, pull up an app on your phone and go follow them and find them. Uh, but every shelter, every vet clinic, every dog pound, anywhere that anybody could possibly take this pet who found it is gonna scan the pet. The first thing we do anytime we hear, hey, I found this dog, or hey, I found this cat as we scan them. And so it does return a lot of pets every year. I think it's a great thing to do. And it actually kind of ties in nicely to our talk about pet anxiety because a lot of pets run away when they get anxious. So we'll kind of swing back to that. I'll finish my little spiel about microchips. So I mentioned it's not a GPS, it's not constantly emitting a signal. Because of that, it should work for the entire animal's life because it's not gonna run out of battery or anything like that. So one chip, good for life. All of your registration companies, typically the good ones, is a one-time fee registered for life. Now, there's still a company that ought to make money. A lot of them will still send you emails to try to get you to buy a better plan so that you know if it goes lost, they'll set out flyers or they'll offer a reward. And if you want those extra services, then you'd have to pay that company every month. But if your dog will be registered forever without paying that company any more money than that initial registration fee. So you don't need to buy all those extras and it will still work when I scan that chip. It'll pull it up in the database. So I love microchips. One time cost, good for life animal, great insurance policy in case your dog ever gets loose or runs off or for, we've had a couple instances where people think that their neighbor stole their dog. If your dog was microchipped, you can tell your neighbor to take the dog that you think they stole into a clinic, scan it, and if it comes up that that microchip is registered to you and not your neighbor, that is proof that that is your dog. Otherwise, you won't have any concrete proof if you wanna claim your neighbor stole your dog. So, lots of different ways it can be used. Um, that was one I didn't expect when I first started looking into microchips but it, has, it is one that I've actually seen in, in practice. So it looks like we got our first question. Um, so when and if a breeder puts the microchip in the puppy, is it registered to the breeder? Or when you purchase the puppy, the breeder tells you it is registered, but you have to register it in your name after the purchase. So that's gonna depend on what microchip your breeder chooses to put in. So a lot of your AKC Reunite microchips that breeders like to put in, they'll register that chip automatically to the breeder. So at that point, the puppy is registered to the breeder. Um, so I know that's the AKC Reunite chips are typically registered that way. So if you don't ever take that extra step to register it in your name, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna scan that chip, I'm gonna get that number, I'm gonna get sent over to the breeder and then they have to contact the breeder and ask the breeder if they remember who they sold the puppy to. And the breeder may or may not know. And if they do know, they're gonna probably have to look it up. And then they're gonna give you them the information that they have for you. But if you moved or you changed your phone number, it's not gonna work. Um, so at the end of the day, sometimes it does still reunite the pet with its proper owner, but it takes a lot longer. Other times, for all those reasons I just kind of listed, sometimes it still ends up in a dead end. And so what do we do? Basically at that point you ask the breeder, do you want this dog? And most of the time they say no, because they sold the dog, they don't want it back. And so then it again, the dog goes to whoever found the dog. And that then becomes that dog's new owner. And that person has the right to go in and change and update that microchip information. 
So that's kind of, again, you, you do want to try to take that extra step. So in best case scenario, if you forget to take that extra step and it was registered to the breeder, we can eventually get the dog to you, but it's going to be a lot harder. And worst case scenario, it's the same as not having microchipped your pet at all. Okay. Um, and then, so there are other microchip companies where it's literally just a chip and they don't, the, the breeder would have to take that extra step to register it to either themselves or to you. Otherwise, it's just going to bring me up a number and the number is going to have zero information at all, which is usually what happens um, when we scan a pet that's a younger pet, uh, it was typically less than six months of age if we're scanning a pet that was found at that age. If they do have a microchip, a lot of times it's just a number. There's nothing with it. And it's, it's really disappointing because you know somebody put a microchip in this puppy, but it, at this point it's just not helping anything. So the chips are uh, very safe. We've never had a chip cause a problem. It does sit under the skin. Is it irritating? No, they don't seem to be. I've never had a pet come in with a chip that was abscessed or had an injection site reaction essentially or any issue whatsoever like that. Um, the way the chips work is when they go in, they're a little bit textured on the underside and so they'll irritate the underside of the skin and they'll adhere to it so they don't wander okay at least the good chips anyway will do this so they don't wander so much so the first day that your chip your pet gets chipped you probably shouldn't rub them a whole lot right there and just let that chip kind of adhere to the underside of the skin now some chips wander okay and so when you if you ever watch somebody scan a pet we don't just swipe right in between the shoulder blades where it's supposed to live we go top of the head all the way down to the tail and then down the legs and everywhere else in case it moved around somewhere we did have one pet, we scanned him, and he ended up having two microchips, okay? So what happens if um, your pet gets microchipped more than once because we were scanning and we missed the chip? Eh, it's okay. That pet we know had two microchips in. Um, why did the chip get missed? There's multiple different reasons. For that particular pet, I think it got missed because the pet was quite obese, um, and so the the one chip you kind of had to flatten the skin out and get it just right in order for it to pop up and the more recent one that was placed in was a little bit easier to find. Then there's also multiple pets out there that have two chips because in order to travel overseas your pet does need to be microchipped with a very specific type of microchip. It's an ISO compliant microchip. So why? The reason why is that when microchips originally came out they were not regulated really in any way. There was no standard microchip and so essentially the ISO compliant microchips would be able to picked up by the scanners that the airports decided to stock their employees with. So for a while there was a chance that your pet could be microchipped then the airport employee would go to scan your pet and there would be no microchip based off of their logic because it didn't come up on their scanner. So you had to put a chip in that would show up on an international scanner, okay? I do believe all of the newer microchips now are ISO compliant. It's essentially become the standard for the microchip world because that's just the type of scanners that the airport decided to stock. And there's no point in putting a chip in your pet if it doesn't work when you want to take it places, okay? So that's kind of the whole point of the microchips. So. I don't think there are really any now. There might be some hangovers. Um, your pet might have an old microchip that can't get picked up except with an old scanner. Uh, not a big deal. You can always just put in a newer microchip and then it should be able to get picked up no problem. And like I mentioned, you can have multiple chips in a pet and it doesn't seem to cause any problems. They don't seem to cause any irritations or anything like that. Um, we do do microchips in dogs and cats. Is the microchip the same size? Yep, but it's still really itty bitty tiny, so it's not a problem for the cats. The only difference I'd really say between dogs and cats is dogs, I've never really been able to feel the microchip in the pet after I put it in. But cats, sometimes the thin ones, you'll actually be able to feel it underneath the skin there um, when you're petting them, but it doesn't bother the pet at all. It just kind of hangs out. Uh, I do have all of my pets 
microchipped my dogs and my cats and I can when I pet them I can feel the microchip on one of my cats uh, but I can't feel it on any of my other animals so um, I think it's very very beneficial so how am I going to tie this into pet anxiety um, well a lot of times pets get anxious especially with fourth of July coming up we see a lot of pet anxiety with that um, particularly in the fourth of July we'll see a lot of pets run away and if your pet runs away, how are you gonna get them home? Easiest way, honestly, is with a microchip. Usually if you have a dog running loose, um, then it's gonna get picked up by the pound. First thing the pound's gonna do is scan that dog in the hopes that they can return it to its owner lickety split. I've, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, my dog never really leaves the house. I personally have had a dog go through a window when fireworks went off, um, so, Sometimes even if you don't have them out to watch the fireworks and you think they're safe at home, you're gonna get a big firework to go off and the dog's gonna be gone. Um, sometimes it doesn't always take fireworks to kind of set them off, but I'd say that's probably the first one that pops into my head because we do hear a lot of lost dogs. Um, you'll see them come up on Facebook, so you'll see the posters put around, and you'll get a lot of calls uh, here at the clinic of my dog went running away, I don't know what to do uh, after fireworks. And so the, the thing I hope the most every time I get one of those calls is that the pet's been microchipped because we can get it back to the owner or whoever finds it we can get it back to the owner and it, it's not going to be a problem at all. Um, so what we've talked a little bit kind of briefly kind of tiptoeing into it, pet anxiety and stress. Is it just fireworks? No, there's lots of other things that can stress your pet out. So we're gonna take a little step back and we're gonna talk about, all right, so just in general, kind of what is pet anxiety, okay? So pet anxiety, probably the biggest one people talk about, especially now with all these changes and everything going on is separation anxiety. I get a lot of uh, my pet just doesn't do well without me, that kind of thing. So that is what would go under the blanket of separation anxiety. Um, when your dog is attached to you so much, they get really stressed out or depressed when they're left alone. Um, it can cause a lot of different things that you're gonna see. And um, you'll notice it come out in a lot of ways, mostly urination, defecations, you'll see that, barking or howling. If you live in apartment complexes, that's the problem or you have neighbors, if you live in a duplex, you get a lot of noise complaints. Um, they will escape and they'll try to find you. So I mentioned um, busting out a window from fireworks. Some dogs will bust out a door or bust out a window when they're left alone. My husband had, grew up with a dog that if they locked it in a doorway from the family, it would figure out how to open the door. It would bite the doorknob and turn it and it would get out. Now it was a it was a larger dog and so it ruined all of the doorknobs until they figured out to stop closing it behind doors because it would crush the doorknob as it turned it in order to get out of the door. But they can get even out of closed doors. Um, some of your uh, bullier breeds, they are quite stubborn and even a solid door won't stop them. They will chew a hole through it and they'll get through. So some dogs do go do some pretty interesting extremes in order to get out if they feel um, that it's not safe for them to be alone, they're anxious that way, or they feel that you're not safe without them there to protect you. So it depends on how you want to look at it, but either way, um, they're stressed out about not being by you, whether they're worried about their own safety or yours, and they're going to figure out a way to try to get to you. Uh, other things you'll see repetitive behaviors like pacing, um, chewing on things they don't normally chew on. So we've had dogs that ate the carpet in the living room or just totally destroyed the couch. Um, sometimes they end up chewing on things that smell like you and so and the risk with that is of course foreign bodies and so that sometimes they get stuck. So sometimes you leave a pet alone and they chew on your favorite t-shirt because it smells like you and they try to eat it and it gets stuck because they're not supposed to eat t-shirts. Digging's a big one, so they can destroy carpet digging, or if they're outside in like a kennel or you have a run or something for them, um, they can dig holes or dig giant things in your garden. 
and just in general kind of making a mess. So some pets will wander around and just pick things up and throw them here and there and just kind of destroy your house, okay, for lack of a, a better things. Um, aggression is also a sign of anxiety. Usually they don't typically display that towards their owners when they see them, but, you know, if you bring them here into the clinic, they're going to get stressed out, and we see a lot of um, aggression towards us because they're anxious, okay? Um, they get really, really clingy. Sometimes they don't want to eat or drink. Um, they'll shake, actually. They'll try to hide under chairs. Um, sometimes if they're really stressed out, so let's say you want to go on vacation and you leave your pet with a friend, they won't eat or they won't drink while you're gone. Um, they just kind of curl up in a corner and wait for you to come back. So it can show up in a, a lot, a lot of different ways. Um, and it can be caused by a lot of different reasons. The most common thing that it gets associated with is essentially a, um, a, an owner or a support person leaving. So that's the separation part of it. Changes in your normal routine. So people can say like, oh, but I leave all the time, but most of us work regular schedules. So if you leave all the time between the hours of, you know, 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. and you're home, okay, well that's fine. But let's say you stay late or you go for drinks after work or something because you can do that again now. So instead of, you know, being straight 7 to 5, you're 7 to 7 or 7 to 9. Well, that hour between 5 o'clock and whenever you get, get home, that can sometimes be really stressful. Um, I know when, when COVID first hit, we saw a lot of stress in cats because people were suddenly home all the time and they weren't used to that. They were used to having a nice uh, empty house all day. And now people are starting to go back to work. And so we're seeing stress kind of the other way. They got used to the way it was and now things change, are changing again. Um, and so oh, we're going to back up because I got a microchip question here. Um, does a pet have to be put under anesthesia to be microchipped? No. Um, the microchip is small enough it fits in a needle. It's a larger hypodermic, which just means hollow, uh, needle. And so we just put it underneath the skin. A lot of times you'll get asked, do you want to microchip your pet today when you bring them in for routine surgeries like spays, neuters, things like that. And the reason that we ask that is because it is a little bit of a bigger needle. So sometimes when you place it while they're awake, they'll, they'll cry out a little bit. And if they're going in for surgery, um, they're gonna be on pain medications anyway. So you don't, you know, the, they're not gonna feel it. They're gonna be out and it's gonna, they're not even gonna know it happened. So they don't have to experience that. It just makes it a little bit nicer for them. And usually if we're spaying, neutering, we've decided we wanna keep this pet forever and it's ours and we love them. And so it's a great time to make sure that they can always get back to us and um, keep them as safe as we can. All right. Are there any natural substances you can give your dog to calm them? Yeah, actually, there, there are. There's a lot of natural stuff we can give them to calm them. Uh, some people think that hemp oil helps a whole lot. Um, some people try to put... Um, lavender on them, um, essential oils. Some people go a little bit too far with that. Uh, if your pet is to the point where if I go to pet them, they're greasy, maybe that's a little bit too much essential oils. Um, I would say probably that if you want to go the essential oil route, the way I've seen it executed the best would be if you get like a scarf to go around your cat or your dog and you put kind of the calming oil on the scarf. Along with that, they sell pheromones, uh, which is pretty natural. They just, um, but they sell pheromones that you can spray around, around the room or the house and you can put it on like a scarf thing as well and just kind of tie it around the pet's neck. And sometimes it is very calming for them. Um, they also sell like diffusers you can put around the house as well to kind of help just kind of give everybody a little bit of a chill. Um, and so that does, there are lots of natural things you can do. Other things that are, are pretty natural, not drug-wise, that you can use to, to help calm your pet are thunder shirts. They're just a tight-fitting shirt, and it's kind of like... Um, the shirt is almost like giving your pet a hug, and it really does seem to calm some of them down. 
we see a we've had a lot of people tell us they make a really big difference particularly for storm anxieties or things like that um, fireworks again usually if you're afraid of storms you're afraid of fireworks it's the loud noises outside they just kind of get you so thunder thunder shirts work really well there are a lot of supplements out there um, but a lot of people ask me about essential oils the lavender seems like it it doesn't really cause any problems except sometimes people get a little excited with it so maybe just you know on a scarf next to the pets so they can breathe it but not get oily and um, and then I've have had some people come in and tell me that the hemp oil seems to help calm them down um, so it, it might as well they do also sell these collars that you can buy um, if you don't want to just spray uh, the the pheromone on the scarf they actually sell collars they're supposed to help admit it one thing I will say about all the oils and the collars and the sprays and all of that is they're really good for intermittent anxieties uh, particularly ones that you can predict so for example if they get really anxious when they go for car rides you can spray it around your car or you can um, get them kind of prepped with it and then put them in the car and that's really helpful if your pet has a, like a severe separation anxiety I think it would help for a little while but then after a little while the body kind of adjusts to it and so if you're going back to work after having been home for a year you're going to be gone for an extended period of time and so I wouldn't expect the the pheromone or the essential oil or anything like that to help kind of keep them calm that whole time it would probably help when you initially leave and it will give you more time away without um, them having the destructive behaviors but I doubt it would eliminate them altogether a lot of trying to eliminate these behaviors for things like going back to work again and all of that is to start small so if you know you're going to be gone for eight hours coming up here in another couple of weeks when you go back to work, try doing short periods and leaving your pet alone and so that they can get used to that. A lot of times crate training is extremely helpful. And the reason crate training is helpful is because it's a space that your dog gets used to going that's their space that isn't next to you and they, they're familiar with it, they know it, it smells like them, it's still part of the house. I would say my suggestions if you want to go the crate training route is to put the crate in a very busy part of the house. Don't put it off in a corner or something like that, okay? It's not supposed to be a punishment, it's not supposed to be a timeout. It's supposed to be a space that they go into that they know is safe and they'll you'll come back, okay? so. For example, I crate train all my dogs. The crate is kept in the kitchen because we spend a lot of our time in the kitchen and in the, we have like our kitchen connected to our eating area. It's not really like an official dining room. It's just, you know, it's bigger than a breakfast nook, but it, you know, it's like the size of a dining room, but it's not really a different room. So it just ends up being this really big dining room kitchen, I guess, the open concept. Okay, so we put the, we put the crate in there kind of like right in the middle and so it's really busy all the time and we use it to help with potty training and so our dogs kind of grow up getting used to the crate it's the space they go to that's safe now if you've already got your dog potty trained and they're experiencing these anxieties and you're like okay well I'm not gonna potty train my dog with this crate did I miss that boat no you didn't necessarily miss the boat um, you can still use the crate again put it in a high traffic area um, set the food and water in it, get them used to being in there, and then when you place them in there, once they're used to it, they, it's not going to be that unfamiliar. Will they still probably cry a little bit as they first get used to it? Yeah, but it's in a relatively safe place, they're not going to be able to destroy things or have any very severe destructive behaviors, and again you want to start by slowly getting them used to that space and getting used to being alone in that space. If you're getting a new puppy and you've had issues with anxiety in your pets in the past and you're like, okay, well, I want to I wanna do it different this time. I want to figure out what can I change so my pet doesn't have this anxiety. How can I get my pet to be confident 
by themselves. And it's not the most popular idea when I tell this to people, but the best way to get your pet used to being alone or being comfortable in their own skin, so to speak, without you, is to not sleep with your pet when they're a puppy. To give them that space that they sleep alone. At least that's what I've had the best success with. So again, I mentioned that we crate train our puppies and the biggest benefit I've seen with that is not only does it make it easy to potty train because they don't have accidents all over my house, but it also gets them comfortable being alone. It gets them understanding I'm going to come back and that it's going to be okay. They're just going to have to be patient. And so it's, it's good and they, once they're fully potty trained, you leave the crate there and you just leave the door open. But I found that it benefits, you don't have to put them in the crate then a lot of times when you leave because they've just, they're already comfortable. They know that you're gonna come back. They are not with you 24 seven. They um, are comfortable with who they are. They have that kind of bout of confidence that life's gonna be okay. Um, having a, a routine is great, but you know, routines change. So if you can give your dog a tool to kind of fall back on and just kind of know that, you know, I'm, I'm okay by myself, that's gonna be really helpful because life does change. If you are lucky enough to have your dog with you all of the time and you have that capability, it can be really tempting to just keep them with you all the time. But then let's say you wanna go on a vacation or you have to go somewhere that your pet isn't allowed to go or, you know, something happens and you have to leave or life changes and you go from being able to stay home all the time to having to go back to work and, and leave the house and all of that. Your pet has no idea and you can't explain it to them because they don't speak English. They have no idea what's going on and it can be extremely stressful because they don't know, are you ever coming back? Who's gonna feed me? Who's gonna give me water? When am I gonna go potty? How do I open the door? All of that. So it can be extremely stressful, especially any change in routine and things like that. So if possible, Try to do it slowly. Try to get your dog set up in, in a space that they feel comfortable um, on their own. Looks like we got another question. Um, if your cat is scared and hiding, are there any good tactics to get them comfortable coming out? So, um, it depends on why your cat is scared and hiding. So. If your cat is scared in hiding because you've just introduced a new puppy to your household, um, then what I would recommend doing is figuring out where your cat's hiding and close off the puppy away from that and essentially give your cat that safe space. Don't pull them out of it and just give them food and water and they'll come out when they feel ready. Uh, the unfortunate thing with cats is a lot of times when something is actually bothering them more than just stress related. Um, so they can be having urinary issues. They can be, um, sometimes if they're indoor outdoor cats that suddenly start hiding, they can have bite wounds. Um, they can have lots of, lots of things going on. Their go-to is hide, okay? So if you're able to find your cat and you don't see any you know, medical reason, it seems like they're still using the litter box fine, then m my suggestion is Essentially with cats, you can't give them a safe space like a crate because if you try to move them from wherever they've decided is their safe space, it just makes it worse. So you have to create that safe space around where they have decided they want to be. And so you give them um, access to food and water and you keep whatever is stressing them out out of that room. If it's a simple change in routine that's stressing them out, then again, just blocking off that room and just leaving them alone with access to food, water, and a litter box in a quiet environment is usually the best way to get a cat to come out from hiding. Now, if something's medically wrong, they're, they're not going to come out. So if you try that method for, I would say, a day, and you notice day, day and a half, and you notice your, your food and your water hasn't moved and your litter box hasn't been used, then they definitely need looked at. Um, and you definitely want to check on them, but I wouldn't pry a cat out of hiding especially if you think it's anxiety related because doing that tends to just make cats a lot worse. We see a lot of cat anxiety in multiple cat households. So 
how do I minimize that among my cats? There's a wonderful resource. Um, it's put out by the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine. The website is vet.osu.edu slash indoor pet initiative. Okay? Um, and we'll, I'll try to figure out how to put that up in a link or something so some of you guys can follow it later. But it's a wonderful resource. It runs through all the different ways you can set up your house to be cat friendly, particularly in multiple cat households. Some of the, the quick little cheats that are really helpful for people is with litter boxes. There's an N plus one rule, okay? So let's say I have two cats, I need three litter boxes. If I have four cats, I need five litter boxes. If I have eight cats, I need nine litter boxes. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that with cats, if you put all of your litter boxes right next to each other, in the cat's mind, that's just one big litter box, okay? So in order for there to be separate litter boxes in the cat's head, the litter boxes need to be apart from each other. They need to not be able to see one litter box from the other litter box, okay? So, um, you're going to need them on opposite sides of the house. If you have a multiple story house, another little rule is you need at least one litter box on each story. So let's say I, I only have one cat and I only have one cat in my house right now. The rest are um, outdoor cats. So I only have one indoor house cat right now, but I have three litter boxes because I have a three story house. So I have one in the upstairs, one on the main floor and one in the basement for her. And she uses all three depending on where she wants to be comfortable that day. And that helps her out, I think, tremendously, especially because we do have a new puppy um, and that can be pretty stressful for cats. So wherever, whenever she wants to avoid the puppy, she still has multiple choices wherever she feels comfortable going to the bathroom that day. And the biggest thing you can do for cats to reduce stress and anxiety is choices. Cats love choices. And just to kind of finish up with that, the same thing with food and water stations, particularly water station with cats. Because if a cat has a choice between braving, you know, the, the scary grandkid or the scary new dog and not drinking, they're just not going to drink. And, you know, I think cats almost are part desert creatures. They feel like they don't ever need to drink, but they would be a lot healthier if they did. Um, so giving them access to multiple watering stations, multiple feeding stations, so that wherever they feel comfortable that day, they can get access to it um, is really helpful. All right, so looks like we got another question here. My dog really dislikes going to the vet. Yeah. Do you have any tips to make the experience easier for him? So tips to make it easier for him. Um, I would say the first thing would be to kind of do a trial run with uh, general strangers because sometimes it's just the stranger danger, sometimes it's the smells of the clinic um, that can set them off. So if it's just strangers in general, then it will be a little easier for you to figure out things you can do. Some pets actually do better away from their owners. Some pets do better with their owners if they really, really hate going to the vet. I think it's because some pets feel the need to protect their owners from this scary person who smells like cleaner all the time. And other pets um, need their owner to kind of lean on, okay? So it, it, it's gonna vary. And you can kind of maybe get an idea of which way your pet would go with the stranger test, okay? So who do you find a stranger that you can try this out with? maybe like a distant relative that you only see once a year, that would be a, a fairly decent test, but take the pet out of his house, maybe take him over to their house and see, do they do better with me or without me? Okay, so that's something that you can do that isn't initially intuitive, because for some pets, they actually do do better when you're not around, because they don't feel the need to protect you. Um, other things you can do, and this would just be a lot of time, as far as on your effort, but you can actually just bring your dog to the vet and just hang out in our waiting room. Just hang out in our waiting room, let him get used to the smells, and then go home. So nothing bad has to happen. They just come in, they hang out, and then they go home. So they get used to going 
to the clinic smelling all of the smells of our disinfectants and nothing bad happening. No pokes, no one had to restrain them. They didn't get a toenail trim. Um, that sets off a lot of dogs as the toenail trims and, and all of that. Other things, and I, I love this for, if you're again trying to set up a new dog for success, um, is you can practice everything I do in the room. So you can practice pulling his lips up and looking at his teeth and looking in his eye and looking in his ear and you can practice taking his temperature. Um, all of that, just make sure you use a lot of Vaseline. You don't want it to hurt. Um, all of that you can practice at home, okay? Um, and it's gonna, then it's nothing new that I'm doing. Uh, and it, it is very, very helpful because then they just kind of get used to it. Like, okay, now they're just acting weird. And the big thing is when you're practicing that at home, I know a lot of people who try to do toenail trims at home will do like two nails and then the dog says, nah, I'm done. I can't, I don't really have that option to come back half an hour, 40 minutes later and do two more of your dog's nails um, or look at his ears and then half an hour later, look at his teeth. So the other big thing is just getting them used to being held even when they don't really wanna be held right now. And if you do it at home, it makes it so much easier for us here in the clinic because your dog just gets used to, okay, they want to do that weird thing again. I'm just going to sit here and deal with it and it'll be over soon and it's not going to hurt. And then we can move on and do something fun. And that's the perfect attitude, honestly, for your pet to take for when it comes to physical examinations and looking at all those things. Because is it overly pleasant for them? No, they don't really like it. Is it painful? No, it's not. They just don't want to hold still. And that's usually what what gets them is they just didn't feel like doing it today. And a lot of times at home, you know, we're like, oh, okay, we'll catch you in a half an hour, no big deal. But here at the clinic, we don't have that option because I can't piecemeal my exam over a few hours. So just getting your dog used to being held even when they don't really want held and doing things they don't really want to do right now especially things that don't hurt is really, really, really beneficial. And that helps out a lot to decrease stress when they come to see us, because then what we're doing doesn't have to be so foreign um, or so stressful. All right, so with that, I think we're gonna work on wrapping it up here. Um, so first I wanna say thank you to everybody um, who's working here at the clinic. Um, I, we've been doing a great job, I think, uh, taking care of our patients, and everybody who works here is just top notch. I, they make my life so much easier um, every day, doing all these things to help me out and make sure we get all the questions answered and everybody taken care of. I also want to do a little shout out to um, Dr. Gardner and Dr. Klein. They also work here. Um, Dr. Gardner, in particular, has been really helping me out in the evening hours. Uh, when I get behind so I can get enough sleep at night, which is very helpful. Um, so other stuff, um, just kind of recapping, we are running a couple specials. They do expire on June 30th. So try to get on there to get some money back for flea and tick products as well as heartworm preventatives and then austral microchipping. Um, will You can get money back essentially for, for microchipping your pet, which is a great reason for a lot of, lot of reasons, and why not get a little money back? Um, and to do. Um, okay, so uh, other thing, I, I was just reading this, sorry. Apparently we are having some price increases we do do this throughout the year as our suppliers increase their prices. I'm sure you guys have been used to hearing that prices are growing up. Uh, we They're going up for everybody across the board. So we've had some prices increase for some of our supplies that we order. And so unfortunately, we do have to pass it along to you guys. Um, and sure, like I said, it's nothing new this time of year, uh, especially with everything reopening you know, prices are, are going up. Gas prices are going up and, and other prices are as well. And unfortunately, so is our prices. So we are gonna have some prices increasing here in the clinic. Uh, good news though, is that we are not changing the prices on our products that are sold on our online store. So those will be remaining the same. 
um, because we they get shipped straight to your door, we don't have to pay those up shipping costs in order to get the product here to the clinic. So you should still be able to purchase those at the same price on our online store that you can access through going through curiousandanimal.com and clicking on that pet pharmacy tab. So while our prices might be going up here in the clinic, they should be staying the same in the online store. Our July theme, so next month when I talk to you is gonna be about summer safety tips. Um, we're getting into some really hot months and that can be a, um, a problem for a lot of pets. So there are definitely things you wanna watch out for, heat stroke being the, the number one that pops into my head, but there are some other things as well. So we'll be covering all of those. Um, all of our past blog posts and everything can be found on um, our Facebook page, Instagram, and YouTube. So if you wanna catch up on some previous ones that we've had, feel free to go there. And we do also have a TikTok channel. So we're trying to post more and more cute videos with our TikTok channel um, and see how that goes. So please continue to follow us, like us, share us, and we look forward to talking to you next month. Bye.